Hi, this is Russ McClay with another podcast from the uh, Dow Lodge archives. And recently, we've started doing interviews with uh, your ranch book readers, try to get a, a little bit of their story in about how they found the book and how it's influenced their lives. And we've done about, I think, about four or five of these so far. And today, we're happy to have as the interviewee, Zabriel Zadrovich. And uh, how you doing, Zabriel? I'm doing great. Great. Well, a nice cold winter night here. <laughs> yeah, well, that's you were telling me earlier that you got a nice fire going there. Right, I'm sitting right next to it. Mm. Well, I think you know, you've heard a couple of these interviews, so you know kind of what to expect. And um, it's kind of it's an opportunity for you to share h- how you found the Ranch book, which I think all of us love to to share that kind of story. And they're also different, so we'll just start real easy. And, you know, how how did you find the Ranch book? What led up? Well, first, <laughs> I should back up just a little bit, and and maybe you could tell us something about yourself. Okay, well, um, I have a little story with my with my birth. It was in 1943, and it was on Christmas Eve, and uh, my parents were in Chicago, and it was, and they hadn't, they were been traveling around, and they hadn't had any time together with each other, and so they figured the best time to have time together each other was when everybody split for midnight mass, uh-huh. and at nine months, uh, 9:25, 44 is when I was born. And then from then I was educated in in 12 years of Catholic education in the Los Angeles area. Mm-hmm. I did all 12 years of them. And all that time I um, always had a spiritual flow of my life simply because when I first arrived on the planet, I came in, um, I was breech birth. And, uh, and at that time there was nobody in the hospital. I mean, all the hospitals were filled except for one and that was white memorial in los angeles and that was a seven-day adventist so they didn't cut people then and so i was breached birth which took quite a few hours and and uh, almost killed my mother and myself and then when i when uh, they finally did release me after six weeks of in that really clean environment my father was in the motion picture industry and as soon as i got home I immediately went into asthmatic convulsions, and I ended back up in the hospital. And for the next 14 years, I was pretty much um, in and out of the hospital and on oxygen because I had one of the worst asthmatic cases they had ever seen. And, wow. Uh, but then I have another little story. Is my Since I was raised in, in Catholicism, my best friend, who did become a priest, and I was thinking of such too, um, he, his aunt, who was a nun, went to Lourdes and brought back a little bottle of holy water. And to make a long story short, he thought it was a good idea that when his parents weren't around, I should sneak over there, and if I made a sign of the cross with it, I would no longer be sick. Wow. Well, one day that happened. I made the sign of the cross, and 57 years later, you know, I'm still, don't get sick. <laughs> wow. And that. And then I went a little bit. Then I went to um, um, college and went into uh, kind of a little bit of meteorology, and then um, met a lady and fell in love and had two wonderful children. And and uh, then all of a sudden, uh, after seven years, that broke up, and I started really wondering and really searching once again for the true meanings of who I was and stuff. And and I went into the psychedelic worlds, and I searched in there, and I searched probably deeper in that world probably than anybody. I had such teachers as Timothy Leary and such to guide me along that journey. And my father was in the motion picture industry, so I also had that. And then after after basically that, my first marriage broke up, um, I was hanging out with a bunch of people up in Hollywood, and... A lady named Aditi was uh, sitting there, and I was with, I was the only white person in the room, and they were talking about Jimi Hendrix had found something. Jimi had found something over on the island of Maui, and they believed that his 
death was because of what he found, but they didn't know what it was. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting there kind of absorbing all this, and I and uh, I says, well, why don't you guys go over there and see what it is? And they go, well, we can't. And I says, well, I'm not doing anything. And, you know, if you guys help me out a little bit financially, you know, I'll go check it out. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of just done, got some money together and got a air, one-way ticket to uh, Maui. And I had a, a traveling companion, a nice little lady was traveling with me. And uh, we got on the island of Maui. And um, a few days after arriving on there, um, I was taken to these people's house. And um, they at that time, her name was Rainbow uh, Patchouli, and his name was Rainbow. <laughs> and they weren't home. So I'm just sitting around there, and all of a sudden, they two of the most beautiful people I've ever seen. She had these sky, um, azure sky blue eyes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, she walked in and she walked over to me. And and at that time, my, I was going by, my name was just the last three letters of my last name. I was called Zad, Mm Z-A-D. And she walked over to me and said, Zad, uh, I've been waiting to give you what I'm going to give you all my life. And I kind of look at her and go, yeah, right lady. You know, in my mind, mm-hmm. and I. But she was so beautiful, I just couldn't even. You know, I couldn't take my eyes off of her. And she walked over the shelf and walked over to me and said to me, "This is the information you've been searching for." And I looked at this big blue book and I said, "Man, what I'm searching for, I don't think it's in a book form." <laughs> and she says, "Well, here, you take this book, and we'll loan it to you for two weeks." And if it doesn't say anything to you for two weeks, you know, we won't bother you again about it. And I go, okay. And so I took off and went back, and I was living on, on a, a beach in, uh, in a, um, it was called McKenna Beach at the time. And so I went off into the Kiavis and got myself a nice little comfortable place and opened it up. And since I was raised in, with, in Catholicism and had already a connection with Jesus, um, I figured, well, if this is what they say it is, then maybe if, um, I don't know. And so I started, I opened it up to the Jesus section. I can't tell you what it was or what section it was, but from that time onward, I knew absolutely 100% the gift that I had in my hands. And all these years, um, 41 years later, I have been a student teacher from that moment till now. Wow, you you really just covered a, a lot of bases there. <laughs> <laughs> but I can fill in too. <laughs> well, so um, yeah, I mean it's it's obvious. I mean that you've uh, from what you've said that um, with the Catholic upbringing, uh, that it seems like spiritual things have been uh, very natural to you. Well, one thing that when I was really sick on those nights when um, you when you can't breathe and you have to sleep on three and four pillows mm-hmm. and you and your parents are so tired that they can't they just won't respond to you anymore and they actually put you on the other side of the house so they can't hear you mm. and so you lay in your bed there and there are um, angels that do come to administer to um, to children. Mm-hmm. And they were as almost as plain to me as as the nurses were in the hospitals to me, mm-hmm. and they were the ones that told me to keep it going, to keep my that I can I can make it through that, and I, sometime I won't have to worry about such things. And so there's always been about you know when I read the papers, all that did was clarify into my consciousness things that I already knew, but I didn't couldn't put them in words. Mm-hmm. And so, but the other thing is, is when I come, when I first, it was 1971, February 1971, and I studied it, I, after, I, after I studied it for like two weeks on the island, um, Rainbow and Patchouli came looking for me to find out, well, we want our, we want our papers back. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I could made them take me all the way into uh, Lahaina, which is like uh, 20 or 30 miles, and that's a long way on the islands. Um, to I wouldn't give it. I wouldn't even let them have it back out of my possession. So I had a copy of it in my other hand, 
to hand them their copy back. <laughs> <laughs> you were hanging That's on. That's how much important. It, 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 see, some people say that they have a hard time understanding and comprehending. Mm -hmm. But to me, I already had all the questions. And when I picked up the book of answers, it all made sense to me. And I realized that for those people who don't have these questions, uh, the answers don't really mean much to them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you get a book of answers and you don't have the questions, uh, you go, what? And so I had the questions already, and it was just, when she has said this is the information you were searching for, it indeed was the information I was searching for. So but, how much time did you, you say you went and found a comfortable place, uh, how, how long was that, a two weeks or? Yeah, I kind of I kind of stayed out there. I fixed up my tent out there so I'd be totally away. And it was probably about ten days when I ran out of food. Mm -hmm. And it was, and then I I wouldn't. I still kind of didn't want to go into town. I just, you know, I ate bananas and and stuff like that. And then they came out to to get their papers, and they says, and I just said, no, I gotta have my own copy. <laughs> and I still have that copy. Uh, along with, uh, I also have one of the originals. I have an original copy too. Mm -hmm. that came into my possession. I got that one from a, a library sale in Mount Shasta. The Shasta Library sold a first edition of Urantia book to me for 25 cents. Nice. That's a nice price. <laughs> That's a very nice price. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so these. Uh, Rainbow and Patchouli. Now, were they uh, obviously they were your ranch book readers? So, were were they doing? It was just the two of them studying together, or um, it was more of um, they were the main focal people of um, of a group of like um, fifteen or twenty that would kind of travel around, mm -hmm. and um, they would all kind of swarm into an area. And, uh, and, 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 and like they would go to someone's house to a party or something, and they would kind of all kind of spread out in the different sections, and they would just start talking to people about the papers. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so that gave that gave me an idea for later on. But uh, but when I did finally leave the islands after you know I got island fever after a few months, mm -hmm. and I had this big notion since I was in the it, it, you know, I was raising the motion picture industry, and I knew lots of people there. I thought, well, I'm going to go back to Hollywood and make the life and teachings of Jesus the movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure a lot of people. Well, I, took it, hmm, I think a lot of people have I had that thought. I took it to a few directors and a few people, and um, if they would have had tar and feathers and a rail at those times, I probably would have been on it. <laughs> <laughs> We don't want anything. They, nobody, nobody. It took me almost a full year before I finally was told about a person out. out someone was driving down, uh, I think it was Colorado Boulevard out in the, the valley mm -hmm. in Los Angeles, and they saw a sign out in front, and it said, Urantia Research. Mm. And they told me about it. I remember you know that. that funny book you have? Mm -hmm. And I said, Yeah. He says, well, there's a sign out there, uh, out there, and I got the address here. And so I drove out there, and uh, that was my first meeting of Bert King. Yeah. And, uh, and he took me in and um, on several different occasions kind of told me his whole life story, just like I'm kind of telling it right now. Mm -hmm. And so I got to, that was my first contact with anybody and then he kind of mentioned this Julia Fenderson, mm -hmm. and then so I went over, and so I went over to um, Santa Monica, and I met Julia, and her and I just, I mean, it was just instant recognition and and friendship right away. It, it was just like, and so she she would, would this kind of sounds funny, she would invite me over there, and we had talked about nine o'clock in the evening. And she'd go to bed, and she'd let me to go into her little nook there off the study, and I would spend all night long going through all of her papers and all of her files. And she says, "Anything there's duplication, you can have." 
Wow. And so that's what I spent a lot of my time was going, letting her go to, you know, I'd get over there before she'd go to bed and then just sit there and then, you know, leave when she went to, went to work. <laughs> wow. So, so that was my first people. The, uh, just to go back a little bit, the, the in Hawaii, it was, uh, what was that, 1971 or so? Yes, February 1971. Mm -hmm. And actually, the um, papers are originally um, given to me either, I'm pretty sure it was on, uh, on, um, on um, Valentine's Day. But, you know, when you're living <laughs> on the islands and all that, the dates weren't really that clear to me <laughs> you know the, I know it was a month of, it was about the middle of February when they were when that all happened mm -hmm. you know in the 70s were really a, a high time for the Arantia book you know it was really uh, getting around you know thanks I think a lot to the hippies the quote unquote hippies yeah, well yes <laughs> kind of lost my train of thought there for a minute there yeah the but, uh, uh, yeah, the 70s. I mean, that was also when I was introduced to it. But, I mean, it was really making the rounds. I mean, I, I'm also from Southern California. and uh, Right. Well, what I did after meeting both Ver, I mean, both um, Julia and uh, Bert King, and Bert, yeah, I kind of wondered what the heck was going on, man, because, you know, it was kind of strange. The foundation was um, suing Bert. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was right in the middle of all that. And I go, why would they be suing him because they had a sign out in front? Oh, I remember and that. I would, I would go over to Julia, and she says, would you like to go with me and, and, and stake out this bookstore so um, Bert can't get any books? <laughs> uh, and I go, um, no. <laughs> and so what I did then, I didn't know what to do. So what I did is I hitchhiked around the Bay, the, the Los, from, from the Bay Area to Los Angeles, up to Sur, all around there. And what I would do is I'd carry the papers under my arms, and when people would pick me up, you know, I'd turn turn them on to the papers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that was that was my first um, really um, uh, really kind of uh, ministry of the papers. I was a hitchhiker with the papers under. Them. I have one, I had that time. I had about in the middle of my back, uh, kind of golden blonde hair, surfer type hair. And uh, I would just let it all flow on my shoulders and get a really nice clothes put on and carry this um, blue book under my thing. And I'd get picked up by, you know, people who were supposed to hear what I was, what I had. Mm -hmm. um, and then Los Angeles became, I, you know, I was born and raised there, but it became more hostile towards me. More and more I was there, the less and less I wanted to be there. And so then... And uh, probably it was seven, 72, I picked up all everything that I owned in Los Angeles and moved to um, up, up to Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. And there in Portland, I was trying to meet people who had the Arantia papers, and there wasn't anybody there either. And so one day I was in a bookstore downtown, and I asked the guy, I said, do you carry the Arantia papers? And he says, well, yeah, I do, but uh, yesterday this guy just bought the last one I had. But he did leave his name there on the bulletin board. And so I went over there, and there was a guy named Robert McKinney, and he lived up in a, a place called Enius, Washington, 13 miles from the Canadian border, way up north. And so I contacted him, and I was really excited. And he says, yeah, there's a bunch of us up here all reading the Urantia papers. And I says, well, can I come up and visit? And he says, yeah. And the circumstances were, were when I called him back, I says, hey, is there a place for me to for my the lady and I to live up there? He says, yeah, come on up. We got a big piece of land up here, and we call it the All Hood. And so I moved up there, and and I met a and the person who whose name was his name was his, he had another name called Jamel. And so uh, Jamel took me on, and he says, yeah, he says, you can stay here and everything, and you can live here in the house and everything, and you and your lady can have this special room here. And, and I had no idea what, I was, what, what it was all about, but it was um, 12 gay guys living in a, in a commune up there that I moved in with. 
but they were all readers of the Arantia papers, and they were the sweetest, wonderful. And for that one, for like three months, um, we just inter interrelated and had meetings every night, talked about it, studied it, um, did other things with it, <laughs> uh, and and finally, um, uh, we I got my own place, and then. From there, I got stuck in the mountains. I was 13 miles from the Canadian border at 4,000 foot level, and I, you know, I'm from Southern California, and I got like 22, 23 below zero, and I go, whoa, and I spent one winter, one winter there up there next to the border, and that was too cold for me. And then I came down, and I crashed into. I didn't want to go back to California, so I ended up in a place called Ashland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, where Shakespeare is, and there I spent um, oh let's see about twenty twenty years there in Ashland. Wow! And I and I had uh, um, there's still an um, herb shop there in Ashland that uh, I started with my ex. I brought two beautiful Urantian three beautiful Urantian ladies into the planet uh, there in Ashland, and. Um, some of you probably who who will be listening to this probably know one of them, and um, she gave birth just recently, and it's Leah and Jim Land from over from the Big Island. Leah is my daughter. Wow. And, and so she so so I have um, all together. I have during all those years, I ended up with five daughters. <laughs> wow, five daughters! My goodness. Right. Yeah. So, and um, three of them are absolute Eurasians. So I did pretty good on it. Wow, that's really that's that yeah, is and, really and, great. Yeah, and Jim and Leah are <clears throat> Leah is Leah is probably I probably had the least input into her life, but she's probably more like me than any other of my daughters. And the fact is, I think they. They cloned her. <laughs> <laughs> she even walks around. She even walks around uh, with a um, with the paperback of the Arantia paper, so that she can, uh, if anybody's in, in her um, purse, so that anybody can, uh, if she's anywhere, she can always whip them out for them. <laughs> so, and uh, our my first granddaughter is um, Ava Havana. Ava Havana. Wow. <laughs> and then Acacia, Acacia May, and then. Um, and just um, on the what was it the twentieth? No, what the gosh, I spaced out. Well, the first part of this month, uh, Leah gave us another another child on the planet, and her name is Anila, which is in Hawaiian means angel or spirit. Mm. Wow, Anila Rose. It's like a real uh, Urantia book family there, right? <laughs> But getting back to um, Washington and that, um, when when I came back to uh, Ashland, um, uh, I was starting to do with Jamel. I met a few people, and we decided to create this thing during the summertime. We'd get together with a whole bunch of hippies, and we'd drive, we had this one big truck with the family, with the people with children, and we were like 30 of us Urantians. And what we would do for the whole entire summer would travel from national park to national park, and the truck would drive the mothers and and the ch and the kids, and all the supplies and all of our backpacks and all that stuff. And all we'd have to do is have this, you know, a backpack with a Urantia book, and a partner. We'd always go two and two, and so for three summers, um, we formed a group called the Traveling Light Circus. And wherever we'd go into the national parks during the um, early uh, 70s there was a lot of um, Christians going to the national parks and having camp camp overs there and they would have every single night they would have um, uh, a circle where they would have a bonfire and they'd play Christian music and then they would have a question and answer session well we would integrate we would sit ourselves in different parts of it and then we would start asking questions and answering questions without ever and our model was never take away, always add to. Mm -hmm. And so the, for three years, that's how we spent our summers. 
Wow. So a lot so, of people during that time really, really got a, a lot of people got turned on to it, <laughs> to the papers through that little caravan of us weirdos. Well, at that time, uh, I know on the West Coast, there were a lot of uh, quote unquote born again Christians uh, that were also kind of out of the hippie culture. Is that the type of Christians that were? Uh, that you were encountering, yeah. so, you know, they would be out there singing, and you know, you, you couldn't go. You would never try to do a fundamentalist because all you'd get was a um, bunch of um, numbers from from them of different parts of the Bible. Mm -hmm. But to the people that you know, the the so-called um, newborns were out there camping and singing songs and being happy, and we just joined in on them and made them even more happier. And I, I think a lot of them really understood the message. And someday, sometimes they would come to our camp the next day and say, we'd really like to know where you got a lot of that information that you gave us last night. Because we never, we didn't find that in the Bible. <laughs> and then that's how uh, we would just kind of slip them in there. And then after that, then I decided that I didn't want to travel around and be hippie too much. So I started uh, a natural foods well, I joined with a friend of mine in a natural food restaurant in Ashland, Oregon, because they have the Shakespeare plays there. Mm -hmm. They people from come up from come from all over the world to there, and so we took a little mama and papa store that was right there on the plaza, and it was called Lithia Grocery. Sure, I remember that. <laughs> and uh, we converted it over to a natural food store, and actually more of a restaurant than that. And for the next um, Let's see, probably 10 years, I can't, no, it wasn't that long, it was like six years, I ran uh, Lithia Grocery, and I made thousands and thousands and thousands of avocado and cheese sandwiches for all the Shakespeare <laughs> toys. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and that's been, no, oh, 30-some years ago since I did that, and I was in Ashland not long ago, and someone walked up to me and says, is that you, Zabriel? And I go, yeah. She says, I haven't had a sandwich like you used to make since you left. <laughs> <laughs> and all that time I would have behind me, I've made all the sandwiches and did all the prep, but right behind me where everybody would look right there, there was the three circles in the papers that for any any time anybody wanted to talk about them. You know, and, and sometimes the people say, what's that big old book there? And I say, here, take it to your table and bring it back. And so that was my ministry for a long time, and and I spent um, 20, 20 years in about Ashland. Yeah, Ashland. Had a big <clears throat> I lived in Ashland uh, 30 years ago. You did? Yeah, I lived on uh, Grandview, um, and uh, it sounds like I, – I remember Lithia Grocery, so I was probably there at the same time you were. I lived – Yeah. I lived on the edge of town. I don't know if you know Grandview, but the main drag go I do. going out of uh, – the main drag, the main drag, it was like two lanes going out towards uh, towards Medford. Uh, you'd make a left and head up the hill. And uh, there's like an apple orchard up there. I lived off the side of that. And uh, I remember lithia water in the park, that natural, right. naturally carbonated I water. I drank lithia water every, every single morning when I went to work. Right. So I'd go over to there, the fountain and people would go, oh, how can you drink that smelly stuff? And I said, well, you know, lithium is really good for the brain. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting but, yeah. that you really, I mean, really went headlong into and right away into uh, ministry. And uh, the whole thing about two by two, by two and uh, you mentioned three years, uh, National Forest doing this. I mean, you know, that's that's really jumping into it. Well, um Way, way back, and we'll back up a little bit here. Um, I said long, right in the beginning that my best friend um, that I was raised with, um, John Knernschild, he became a Catholic priest and became and went all the way up to to being the um, uh, priest in charge of the um, theology department for the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. He was he became uh, he went into um, the Carmelites. He went to Mount Carmel. Mm -hmm. And um, and now he's retired in in back in by Chicago back there. But uh, yeah, I was I was going to become a, a Catholic priest too. That was we were going to go into the seminary together and everything. And I had these urges in my body, and I go, you know, John, I really don't know if I want to give up women till I know what they were all about. Mm -hmm. 
And he says, well, no, we got to go in the seminary right away. He says, we got to do it. And as well, mm, I think I'm going to give a year of year of it off. Mm-hmm. Give give myself a year. Well, in that year, um, I met a lady and uh, we had sex. Well, that was the end of my priestly ideas. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. I wasn't going to give up women after I once knew what they were all about. <laughs> right. And so all my life, I've had a knowing whatever job I had and whatever I did, I didn't. I, up till the time I received the papers, I knew that there was something more that I was searching for, and I did search. And when they handed me the papers saying, these are the papers, this is the information you're looking for, it was the exact words because I was searching for it. I knew there was more to what was on the planet that they were telling me about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just knew it. <laughs> so you had that, and so uh, when I got it, I knew it. I did, it, it was no question. Mm-hmm. From the first from the first sentence I read out of the papers, the spirit of tu- truth connected into my my mind, just like must have been the apostles. I had, whoa, this is it. <laughs> well, it and seems like so it. I didn't have any doubt or question of who and what I had. Mm-hmm. Never ever from the moment I first touched it. Well, that is something um, I'm always curious about. Um, I mean, obviously, a lot of things led up to that moment. Um, you know, ha- had had they said that one sentence maybe five years previous to that, it may not have had the, the same impact. Well, um, it depends. You know, I, I don't know. I, well, I always say everything works in, 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 uh, in the sequence that you're ready for. Mm-hmm. And I was at that time, it seemed like I was ready for it because, you know, I went there to find out. And I do believe that it was the Arantia papers that Jimmy Jimmy did was given. And I'm not too sure that's why the things happened to him. But I never really, once I had the papers, that all that other, I took them back to, to Hollywood and gave them a copy. But I don't know really whatever happened or anything else on that aspect of it. Mm-hmm. But um uh, I don't know. I I just always, to me, the papers. Um, well, it's it. I've paid dearly for it. I've gone through um, two marriages, and basically, my advice to any young person in the Urantia movement, listen to it very carefully. Make sure that your partner has comprehended spiritually the things that you have comprehended. Otherwise, you're going to end up. Julia told me that way back in '74. She told me, "Make sure she's in your ranching, ladies, April." And and I never paid attention to that. And I can honestly say, um, you know, you might be. It's just like two railroad tracks, and it when you're first starting off, there's only a half a degree difference in your in your in your movement forward. Mm-hmm. But as you move for any length of time, that half a degree separates you further and further and further and further and further to where um, basically I had a choice to curve and go over to and be with my partner or to stay with the papers, and I always chose the papers. Mm. Yeah, I mean the the master, uh, Jesus, you know, made a point about that, about – um, about the family <clears throat> and the importance of the family over the importance of, uh, you know, the family of, of God or of God. And, uh, right. well, you know, something that comes to mind, uh, Zabriel, is, uh, you know, your ready acceptance of it. I think your history and just your nature, um, even somebody with the same upbringing, let's say in Catholicism, I have many friends that were brought up that way, but certainly did not have any kind of spiritual inclination or hunger. Um, and now, in your reading of it, um, you know you've pretty much expressed that you accepted it fully, a hundred percent. And I know a lot of readers, and certainly myself, uh, you know, there's this aspect of faith and in believing, for example, that the Arantia book is what it says it is uh, in its entirety. And I'm always curious about people that, uh, for whom that doesn't, uh, that question doesn't come up. And I know a few people. Right. I I don't – there's – I've often questioned these things. Like I question um, 
why did not my brother, who was raised in the same bedroom next to me, went through really similar experiences as I did, it was just never comprehended or never was interested in, in it. You know, it's just, you know, it's like, I, you know, I, I would say, Jimmy, this is it, this is it, this is it. And he goes, well, I don't, I don't know. I got my work to do. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and so, it, you know, it's like, I don't know. Uh, and it's it's one person usually in, in, in a family. And I think with, uh, when the old man was talking on the phone, and he says, I didn't come to bring peace. I I brought came to bring uh, uh, turmoil within family. You know, there'll be you know people upset about the, you know one wanting to go be part of the kingdom and one not. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I find that to be true. And that's cost you know it's it, it's been pretty interesting to hang on to the papers and and it's kind of like a long time ago a very very wise uh, Hopi woman took me aside and and she told me and she says the Arantia papers are like a river it's a river of truth and there's some people that'll come up to it and look from a high mountain and look down on the river and say I know the truth and then there'll be some that'll come up to the bluff and look down on the river and say oh I know the truth and there'll be some that will go up to the shore and even stick their feet into the into the river and say, "Oh, I know the truth." And then there's these people who are floating down on the, uh, down in big barges and saying, "If you don't join our barges, the river of truth will drown you." Uh -huh. But she said to <clears throat> me, "What your mission is is to swim out to the middle of that river, and then once you get your stability." Look around you and then form a family because the river has its destiny. And all you have to do is go according to the flow of the river and your brothers and sisters around you, and you'll be guided to the exact spot you needed to be. You need to be. Mm. And that's been my whole thing for a long period of time. So I assume you've read the whole book. I mean, uh, you mentioned the Jesus papers Probably at first. Probably 20 or 30 times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and my, I, I, well, my first Urantia book, um, it started causing me lots of trouble. And one time it caused me so much trouble that I picked it up, ripped it in half, and threw it out the window. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> and, and figured that was it was really kind of like it was in my mind. I heard the cock crow three times, and I ran out there and I cried and I said, "No, no, no! I didn't really mean that." Oh, that's and good. That was that was my first. That was a book I had from Hawaii, and then right after that, I replaced it, and I I have a 1976 edition that I've had from the year it was published till now. Right. But it's beat up. It's a lady a long time ago gave me a covering for it. It's a um, kind of like a, a denim covering, mm -hmm. and that's the only thing that holds it together. <laughs> yeah. Because all the binders all gone and all the you know it's it's you know it, 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 when I put it down, all I have to do is lay it down. What I do is if I go to a dentist or a doctor's, I carry the my my big old book with me. And just because it looks like a hundred thousand years old and it comes out with all this energy, I just I'm sitting there reading it and people will right across the room with a whole bunch of patients and they go, Hey, what are you reading over there? And I says, Well come on over here and I'll tell you about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I gotta go in here. Here, you read it while I go in and have do have the dentist. <laughs> and so that it no matter where I go, no matter what I do, that's my mission. That's nothing else. Everything else will be provided if you just keep on true to your mission. Mm. And to me, my mission is to make sure that I have touched as many human beings on this planet as possible. And and it doesn't even have to be given the Raja papers because love is a very powerful instrument. And people just don't. People have forgotten or have never learned that love doesn't come with any conditions. Love flows from this deep channel within the deep center of you. And this is what the papers taught me is that 
that center that I knew that I had within me, that I knew I had a small, quiet voice because I heard it when I was a kid, mm-hmm. um, telling me it was going to be okay. <laughs> and uh, But I just i have always listened and always known, and when the papers told me about the thought adjuster and, and explained to me how this fragment of the father and dwells my mind, from that moment onwards, I've been trying to adjust myself to a point where it's to what I look at it is I am the soil for the spiritual plant called my soul to grow in. Mm. And so it's up to me to make the conditions of my personal life fertile so that the spirit within me can grow this joint creation so that we one day on the higher worlds can actually greet each other and become one. And it's these are you know, these are the concepts that I that I come up with in my mind and these are the ideas that that flow through me is that I just have so much love in me for all my brothers and sisters that just it's really hard at times to contain myself. It's all so you know, beautiful. Like, yeah, you know, it's like I really, you know, it's like when. You, well, it's just like anything. If you have an un, unlimited amount of um, of water in the middle of the desert, um, you would be really foolish if you didn't share it. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the more you share your gifts uh, that you've been given, that means that it's not going. You know, they don't. They don't say, hey, man, when you leave here, it's going to be an easy game the rest of the way home. Oh, I think they tell us quite the contrary. <laughs> fact is, they say, you know, it's, not, it's a struggle all the way home. Mm-hmm. And I need all the brothers and sisters I can possibly touch here on this planet to help me along the way on the way home. Because I'm kind of a blunderer at, my, at times. <laughs> I liked so. uh, where you were talking about um you know, that moment, I, you said you threw, threw the book out or th- threw it out the window. All right. You know, that's, well, uh, I was looking for the per- that kind of story is, uh, that comes up a lot in stories, you know, where people reach, you know, uh, get get to that place with, with the Arantia book where it's uh, literally, they feel like just throwing it away. This seems to me more harm and more craziness than it's worth, is what I said. <laughs> <laughs> And I actually ripped it in half and threw it as hard as I could <laughs> because it was, you know, it was, you know, it, I was living with uh, uh, an organization that, cause I didn't know when I came out of the mountains, I, I heard about these people called ontologists or the emissaries of divine light. And their leader was called Yoranda. Mm-hmm. They go, Oh wow. And they were really close to what the papers were. And that's uh-huh. why I thought I will go uh, help them out. Well, <laughs> they helped me out all right <laughs> and so but you know it's it's always no matter what how hard it is to hang on to to your ranch of papers in your life it's definitely after 41 years i can honestly say i would do it all over again even though it's been painful and i've gone through things that i won't even I don't ever want to go back through to even think about again mm-hmm. for them, but it's worth it. Yeah, it's worth it. Well, your your story, I mean, it's really quite remarkable. I mean, it just it seems like you know your whole life uh, is is uh, you know had a, such a strong foundation based really solely on the Arantia book. Um, and I I think a lot of people, uh, you know, there's a lot of new readers that just get exposed to it. And I often think, you know, you and I have been reading it for so long and I, it's hard to put myself in the shoes of somebody who, who just has been uh, introduced to the Urantia book. Right. The uh, fact is David Clearwaters and I, uh, we're reminding each other, the fact is I'm reminding him more than him to me, but <laughs> that, um, hey, how, how did you feel when you were um, five years old uh, into the papers? <laughs> well, yeah, that's right. I was kind of like they are, aren't they? Wasn't I? And I go, yeah. One mm-hmm. of the other things that we, we, David, David and I, and and our Southern Oregonians, we, David Clearwaters, uh, I think has 
the record of having 25 years of continuous study group. Mm-hmm. Oh. And and plus on top of it, um, in those early years, we had um, every single weekend. I mean, every every year for one weekend of the year, usually the first weekend in June, um, we had here in Southern Oregon a Urantia camp over. Mm-hmm. We had people from the foundation, and every year um, Mo would come over with his celestial seasoning van and fill us all up with teas, and and we'd have a week, and that lasted for 25 years too. Mm. And so, so we have probably the longest running uh, camp over convention in the history of the of the of the movement. <laughs> but yeah, we'd have you know, and then Burn would Burn Grimsley would come up, uh, and we would uh, rent the junior college here, and we'd have people. The whole auditorium would be full, and Burn would give us talks and stuff like that. So. Um, in Southern Oregon, um, there's a lot of people that came in and touched uh, David Clearwaters and I and have left us and um, have um, w- walked away from the valley with um, with uh, one of the greatest treasures mankind has ever been given. Mm. You know, in your in your reading of the book, uh, uh, there are some parts for me that are difficult of, of concept, and I wonder if there are any p- papers that uh, provide challenges to you? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, you, but see the thing of it is with the papers. Um, well, I have a hard time when the first parts of the angels and all these different things. That's not where my mind really. Would, but you ask me anything on the Jesus section, and I can pull that out right away. Mm-hmm. And my what I've always telling people is if you have if you have any kind of comprehension or touched the spirit of truth or know who Jesus is in your heart, you know, I use any kind of language I can use. Um let's see where was I gonna take that? Well about being oh, the Jesus. The paper to read the life and teachings of Jesus because I believe and they make a statement the most important information you can have is Mm -hmm. the knowledge of the life of the creator son as he lived it on your world Mm. and so i say most people they say oh start in the beginning now i looked at that forward for 20 years before i started trying to comprehend it Mm. and i really never comprehended it until i went through the study group with uh, chris halverson when we went through the front part oh uh uh-huh and there was with uh, Cemetery of the Soul, and we mm-hmm. went through that whole thing, and and then I started understanding it because there was, you know, 15 or 20 minds plus all these other people in the universe all functioning together, and um, between uh, 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 Kermit Anderson and and James mm-hmm. uh, Woodward and and Chris and and Anne, and all of us out here in in, in Cyberland. Mm-hmm. Um, it's amazing the I think we all teach each other and I think even and Chris teaches himself at times. <laughs> yeah. No, and I was going But it, it, <clears throat> what I always try to tell anybody if you don't understand it keep reading through it and keep going and and it'll you, you can come back to it. Mm. You know, you're on a mission. You go uh, <clears throat> if you're going to read I want you to read the whole life and teachings of Jesus. Don't just go go for it. Go all the way through it. And if you don't understand something, you'll understand it later on. But go through it. Reach that transformation of what happens to you when you got that information in your mind. Right. Yeah, I think it's really amazing uh, right now. The uh, with the internet. Uh, I mean, I'm like you. You know, from the days of newsletters that would be mailed to you. But I mean, my God, now we have, you know. Uh, radio shows. We have uh, Facebook. I mean, in terms of study groups, I mean, uh, these are global study groups and um, are really opening up um, a lot of unique possibilities and potential. Right. I just posted on uh, your ranch at Facebook. You might uh, about um, this guy who put together at the, over 2,000 people from all different parts of the world in one choir. And they're all singing over the internet together. Wow! 
Uh, you know, Ben, it, it, when I heard it, it kind of gave me the idea of what it must be like when, when the higher when we're on the higher worlds and we all go into the worship mode. Yeah. And we get so carried away that um, that the deities go, "Whoa, dudes, calm down down there. We're done." <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, it's like group, so, you know, it's like group prayers, or like you know, where where uh, somebody sets a global time and everybody, you know, uh, sits down and says a prayer or something, or says Om, or uh, <laughs> you know, it's there's power yeah. in that. We we know the power of that. But yeah, I mean, um, you mentioned uh, Chris Halvorsen and uh, Symmetry of Soul. I mean, I find that just to be fantastic. You know, um, you know, fantastic in terms of being lessons, but also in terms of just what I said, this connectedness of being, I mean, there's a lot to be said for standing in, in the presence of somebody. Um, the difference between talking to someone on a telephone and actually sitting in their presence. But if you get past that, I mean, it's all in our heads anyway. And that space, right? you know, that space is actually, I mean, I've certainly seen it, is that there is an interconnectivity that transcends time and space between humans, I think, through our spiritual selves. And, um, yeah, I'm I'm just you know I'm fascinated. I mean, this uh, Facebook is how I met you, and now I find out that you and I have been dancing around each other for decades. <laughs> <laughs> I know it. it. It is it is pretty am uh, amazing that how all the interconnectedness and stuff like that, and and um, you know just like I was reading one book, uh, you know how how you found the the Aradja book that was put out not long, no, well, quite a few years now mm -hmm. ago, um, and there's a lady in there. I didn't. I had no idea, but there's a lady named um, Joy Brandt in there. Uh -huh. A lot of people know her, and uh, she she attributes her acceptance of the Arantia papers sitting in my room, listening to me telling someone else about the Jesus papers. Nice. And I go, whoa! <laughs> I never do <knew> that. <laughs> well, that's gonna happen, Zebra, with the amount of. Uh, rapping that you do out there. <laughs> yeah, I kind of pulled in the mouth, aren't I? <laughs> no, I mean you're. But I'm excited. You know, that's the thing is, I, I don't understand how people aren't. It, it's it blows my mind to know that I have in my possession one of the greatest treasures ever given to mankind throughout all eternity. Absolutely. I mean, they tell us that. Well, uh, when you get into the seven stages of light and life, we kind of reveal the uh, central universe to you and uh, the, uh, the Trinity. Uh, uh, what? You you don't do that till the seventh stage? What are you doing? Why are we getting this now? <laughs> so the so what we have here is uh, people just I just don't understand. They don't see the 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 treasure they have, and they don't. To me, it's worth giving up everything on the material world for it. Mm. And no, once you I, do, you got everything. Yeah, I think a lot of people get that feeling. I mean, it's the people that, uh, you know, say, why aren't there billboards on every freeway? And, uh, you know, they want to do ads. And they, there's a lot of excitement when you when you start realizing, and like myself, you know, the value of the Arantia book and what it is. I mean, it's uh, it's definitely something you want to share. And it, and that provide, uh, that presents a very unique challenge uh as you so well know i mean you i mean you go out especially you know i mean any part of it i mean one interesting thing about the to me about the jesus papers for instance that although it is certainly uh uh or let's say most probably the the most approachable part of the book in the very beginning of it it starts off with talking about you know michael of nebadon and uh right. and if you're sharing that well, let's let's say you know your average person um and let's say you share it with a Christian. Well, they're going to be comparing it to the Bible. But right now, an interesting phenomena that I'm seeing is that uh, a lot of young people, let's say 20s and 30s, Internet savvy people, are uh, pretty much it's becoming hep to be an atheist. And, right. And sharing the Arantia book with somebody of that mindset uh, presents, like I said, a very interesting challenge uh, because people are becoming very dismissive uh, you know, of anything that has the word God in it. I remember 20 years ago, I started seeing this, that the young people start, uh, they started to uh, uh, use all lowercase if they wrote the word God for any reason. Right. You know, so, but how how do you feel about the, overall about the Urantia book 
quote unquote movement now? Well, um, the unification is starting to move towards um, a unification, but the, you know, um, I've studied the whole thing. I, I, you know, like I was, I know all, I have studied really deeply on who all the players were in, in the chaos in the movement. And, mm -hmm. but we are now getting into an era where we do have the internet. It's not just an isolated headquarters and, and, and people running around trying to think that they can't give the papers to everybody. And that was the first mindset in the, in, in the uh, early stages. You had to earn uh, basically the right to have a pay, to have your answer papers. Mm -hmm. And I was always against that. I was out to, I was like Burt King. I've been a rebel. I was out to, I, you know, I got letters and everything else about using the circles and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause I would do, you know, I've been an artist all my life and I've always used the circles <laughs> way back in my uh, hippie years. I would, um, do, do these drawings, these really neat space drawings with these circles and all of the universe and all sorts of kind of like Peter Max type of drawings. And um, somehow, some way, the foundation found out, and I got a letter saying, you can't put the three circles into your drawings like that. Oh, my. And uh, I, that's, you know, I've, I've never, I've, I've, I've been one of the rebels out here that was fighting for the name of the Arantia to be free-flowing because it's the name of our planet. And you cannot copyright, from my way of thinking, maybe it's from my early stages of being around Bert, <laughs> Bert King, mm -hmm. um, is that you, the, the concentric circles are the material emblem of the Trinity government of all creation. It's the it's the emblem that the Creator Son chose to chose as his emblem of his universe, and um, Maccabean to Melchizedek um, had it on his um, on his on his um, clothes on his over his heart. So you know, I go, um, how can that be copyrighted? <laughs> right. So I've been kind of a rebel out here um, doing it, but now I see with. I, I see a really good a unification. There's still a lot of people that got s sat on what I call the foundation stove and got their butts burned. Mm -hmm. And but you know the blisters have gone away and and it's, and it's just you know it's just a, a memory of it now. And I keep telling people, okay, we have a we 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 are uh, have the opportunity at this stage in all of our lives. To go down in history as the earlier, we 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 direct the history of this planet by what we're doing, mm -hmm. and if if you can comprehend that, uh, you are have the same. All of us Urantians have pretty much the same ability to change history as a president does, mm -hmm. because you know who knows one of us may have a child or one of us may meet the right person and uh, it could change the whole entire flow. Um, all I can say to everybody is that one of the most important things never become de discouraged and mm -hmm. that sometimes your greatest disappointments turn into your greatest blessings. Yeah, that's, uh, that's certainly true. Um, yeah, the well, the legal stuff. I remember back in the '80s, and it was uh, it was quite messy. Um, and uh, I forget the gal's name, but the gal that uh, did the folio version, one of the first. Right. Uh, what was it? I think it was. Um, was it Christ Christine? Christa? Chris? I forget. Something like that. Something. Yeah. <clears throat> At any rate, that. Yeah. Was well, did you know they spent as much money on not to get into that too much, but yeah. they spent as much money fighting her. Than they spent up to that time for all the translations. Yeah, and I think it's still even still today. So, but but besides that, I see a unification happening, and you know it's um it's unity. Uh, uh, you, you know, it's we don't we will never become uniform because there's <laughs> we're too different. But uh, uh, unity 
without uniformity is really a model that we should all fully understand. And one of the things I have the hardest time with with fellow Urantians is when they start bashing each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, we should start helping each other. We should be there to support one another to a point where we we're changing the course of the entire cosmos, not just our planet. Mm. But when we make this transformation, if we can do it, phew. And one of the things I would like to put on, put in here right now is I would like to share my daily meditation. Mm. My daily meditation, I stand in front of the Ancient of Days, and just like the old man said about the old lady who, who would go to this mean, stern judge, and finally after... A long period of time, we were standing there, sitting there, staring at him. He says, well, oh, woman, what do you want? I'm going to grant your petition just to get rid of you. And I'm kind of like that in front of the Ancient of Days. And if enough of us get up there, I'm not calling for the adjudication of the rebellion. All I'm calling for is certain personalities that were left behind to be taken off of our world so we can have it without them on here. Mm. And that's Caligastia and Delagastia. They have to go. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's my meditation every time I can think of it is you know they they are still here and no matter what people argue that they don't have a lot of um, influence well if you understand and watch study the history I've studied the history of, of this planet on the material level as deeply as I have studied the Urantia papers and I'll tell you a little story here that to tell those people to not to get too weird with the papers like I did because it can cost you great, great, great harm. And most people don't know it, but the dark forest planet city on this planet where all the financial and all the really craziness comes out of is London, England. Mm -hmm. And London is shaped in the shape of three circles, St. Paul's being the center. First circle, every banking cartel of the world. Second circle, every major media of the world. Third circle, every major insurance of the world. And from that hub, all financial and international things are regulated. And in the olden times, when the king or queen would come into the inner city, they would pass the Lord Mayor a silver sword. And if he gave it back to them, the king or queen could come into the inner city. And today, the, city, the inner city of London is as separate from England as the Vatican is from Rome. And it's the power center. So, well, I figured, well, man, I've been studying the rebellion and all this. I'm going to challenge old Caligastia when I go to London. And so I went to London, and it was a banker's holiday one day. And I had, where they, uh, up where I live here in Oregon, they had blasted out of a mountain, and they had... He had a quartz, uh, uh, um, purple quartz uh, vein, and so I had a bunch of crystals, and I thought, <coughs> what I'll do is I'll walk around St. Paul's right in the center of the force and call out to Caligasta and challenge them. Huh. Well, my father-in-law, who at that time was the head mason for the Masonic Lodge of London, um, he took me and showed me all these things, and as you come into the city of London, there's a big wing griffin there, and on every corner and every street, there's the griffin that guards the inner city, and it's still a separate, it's the financial hub of the world. Mm -hmm. And um, so I went into there, and, and um, my father-in-law walked me around and showed me all this stuff, and he said he had to go to the bathroom. So when he went in, I decided that I would walk around the whole entire circle around the church sprinkling these, uh, these crystal dusts, and um, and and I was calling Telegast to come. You know, I told him he was a wimp and all this stuff. And Ludo came out of the uh, out of the church and says, "What are you doing, Zabro?" And I go, "Well, I'm just kind of doing this." And he says, "You shouldn't be doing this." And he took me out, and we went out to the inner si out of the city. And he was kind of upset with me. And he says, "Oh, but first, there's one thing I want to show you outside the walls." Were, since you were Catholic, the monks had a, they couldn't live inside the city. They had this compound there, and there's some plants in there that I'm a, I, like, I like any kind of plant. 
And he says, there's some three and four and 500 year old plants in there and it's a banker's holiday. And so there won't be any guards out in front. So we sneak back there and, um, the, um, I sneaked around he says, okay, you take a look around the corner. I look around the corner and I almost bump heads with this little old Englishman and he goes, Oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to look at the plants in the old, old uh, trees and stuff. And he says, Oh, you're an American. Well, I'll show you around. And he showed, showed, took us all through the grounds, and it's now an ambassador's um, retreat where they retirement place. And, mm-hmm. and he took us into the main <clears throat> mess hall, and he locks the doors, and he opens up all these cabinets, and there are all these old carvings by the monks. And then he says uh, to me, he says, you, um, I want to show you this temple that they built. And my father-in-law started coming in with him, and he says, no, I just want to show, uh, show this, this young man here. And he went in there, and he opened up this door, and it was a big room. Well, it was probably about 10 by 10. And it was all carved in wood of different angels and that. And then on one wall, there was three angels. And he says, you meditate in here for a minute. And he closed the door behind me, and it was three angels. And on each hand, they held uh, kind of like a, a, a one was a base. and But through it, you could see through the wall, and you could look at all three of the th- different three circles of the inner city. And this is the honest happening to me. Out of one of the holes came a kind of like a green-like serpent and says to me, Zabriel, for the challenge you have made to me, sometime in the future, everything that you love will be taken away from you, and you will never see it again. And I kind of laughed, and I went, well, and it shook me up for a long time. I told people about it, and probably about two years later, my English wife went back to England, and when she came back, she wouldn't give me a kiss. And two days later, she took my children and disappeared, and my children are still locked up in the inner city. Mm. So watch yourself, folks. It's it's real and it's alive, <laughs> and things can happen to you. <laughs> How long ago was but, that, uh, Zabriel? Um, It's um, pretty close to... 20 some, let's see, let's see, 20, is it there? 22 years ago. Oh, that's quite a while ago. Yeah, and I'm, they're still there. <laughs> <laughs> and one of my daughters, uh, Kalina, who's a, a Urantia book reader, she's, I know your story, Dad, but I, I just can't leave here. Mm. And all, all of them are still right there in, in the inner city, not outside the city, in the inner city. <laughs> so... <clears throat> but that's just one of my little stories. I got a hundred thousand of those stories like that that well, the universe allows me to take home with me. <laughs> we're gonna have to do another one of these. Um well yes, Abril, I, I think um, you know, we are getting towards the end of this particular one and I, I think I'd like right. to uh conclude uh by giving you uh, a chance to speak maybe uh some advice for, for new readers. Uh, I would love to uh, give everybody, especially the new readers, read Julia Fenderson a long time ago said, if you want the power of the papers to be totally in your life every day, if it's just one sentence, read out of the papers every single day and don't ever be discouraged no matter how tall the mountain seems to be that you have to climb. It's all well worth it because on the other side, it's it's worth it. <laughs> it's worth it. Well, it's worth it. No matter what you have to go through, it's worth it. And the other thing is, is the the universe wants us to learn what unconditional love is, and that is just you get yourself into such a mode of of of, of joy because of what you're doing, is that. You see the Father in every human being that you look in their eyes of. Mm. And when you can do that, you've achieved what the Father wants us to do here on the planet. I haven't done it totally yet. Yeah, I don't think any of us have. <laughs> I think we'll be in the, uh, up in the upper circles by then. <laughs> For sure. But I know it's possible. See, I, I've seen the dream. I know the dream. I know what's on the other side. And all I can say is, um, just like uh, Martin Luther King says, I dreamed the dream, and it's well worth doing whatever we got to do to do, get to it, because the Father has 
Give us the dream, the dream. So don't give up, my friends. Mm. I love all you Urantians out there <laughs> and everybody else. <laughs> no, it's great, Zabriel. I mean, I I really have enjoyed uh, getting to know you better through the, through this, and uh, I think a lot of other people uh, who, who probably even know you might learn something more they didn't know. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think. Uh, I think we can uh, leave it at this for this interview, and All right. we're going to post it up on um, on Facebook. And I also have a web page where I'm going to be uh, have a, a list of all of them. Um, still working on that a little bit. So um, for this time, Zabriel, thank you very much for your time. Uh, oh, my pleasure. <laughs> and uh, hope to do it again. And once again, if anybody is interested in um, doing one of these interviews with me uh, to tell your story about basically how you found the Ranch book and uh, topics related to that, uh, just drop me a line via Facebook or whatever. So uh, take care, Zabriel. Uh, we'll do it again hopefully soon. All right. Well, I sure appreciate it, and uh, thank you for what you're doing, my brother. Thank you very much. Right on. Okay. Love you all. Good night. <laughs>